Hello, friends. I've got a four versus four set on for you. Average rating today, just one point shy of the 1600 mark and a very minor advantage to the team on the lower west side. Now let's go introducing our friends. A 19 point advantage across the board uh, for these guys, which means it averages about uh, just shy of five points per player. So very little. Of course, the uh, Supreme scoreboard up there does round the player ratings off to the nearest 100, so isn't entirely uh, accurate, but that's why I've gone ahead and done it for you. So let's introduce our players. We'll start with the forward position then on Team 2 is Silent Bug. He's a 1400 there in gold going Aeon First Land. Silent Bug with two eyes. I assume it's a silent uh, eye as well as being a silent bug. We'll have to see if he... Uh, if he makes up for it by playing somewhat reasonably in the middle. Uh, I don't think it's a name that I've come across before on the channel. As we move to the south on the beach lot is Zach. Certainly seen this guy before. Uh, he's UEF 1900 uh, going first land as well in grey. In the rear with the gear for team two in purple we've got Genghis Khan. He's an 1100 Aeon. Having gone first air which is somewhat unusual for the rear slot. And as we round things off for Team 2, VIP, the only player above the 2k rating today, Burgundy Red as Seraphim going first air. As we switch over, let's go to his opposite number just because in Electric Blue, we've... Uh, blue, in Electric Blue, uh, we've got good game, please. Thank you. Uh, this guy's perhaps better known as you, so I think we'll stick with you because it's, a, it's, a, it's a less of a mouthful. Uh, so you, uh, the only other 2k rated player, or 2100 perhaps should we say, going first land, looks like second air there in Cybran Electric Blue. Continuing our rounds in the clockwise direction, we've got Sky Blue, Marcus M, or Marcus, also Cybran there, making his way towards the front, being the uh, forward player for team number one, having gone first land. Being a uh, 1300 if I didn't already mention. As we continue up onto the beach we've got, uh, I don't know if it's Lucius or Lucas, I'm going to go with Lucas. Either way it's a UEF in Bran, 1800 having gone first land, second air already. And as we finish off the introductions, last but not least, although uh, maybe is the, oh no it's not, <laughs> at least not by the player rankings. Not that that matters too much anyway, because I've heard Ospol plays far better than his 1200 rating would suggest why that is who knows but he's a 1200 uef in ferrari red going first land second air and at two minutes 55 seconds begins bagging himself the cheapest upgrade available to any commander in the game the uef commander drone getting himself just the one assisting and look at that uh, upgrade flying up there and with its player introductions are complete 3 minutes 12 seconds, we've got the usual meta it would seem with the two forward players making their way towards the central area accompanied by the two beach players. This is of course a meta in the higher rated games and has been for some time now. VIP bagging himself the side island there just a few seconds behind you who's already got his, you with three engineers down there. Uh, actually electing to get the mass points first, then a little bit of manual reclaim, and then working on the land factory. And if we take a look at VIP, looks like very similar work indeed. Mass points first, bit of manual reclaim, and then a land factory. So almost identical openings there. Take a look here. We've got lots of manual reclaim on the tree clumps, of course. Tree clumps uh, only being worthwhile before units traverse through them. And that probably explains, yes, it absolutely does. Look at this engineer here from Swayazak. All of these little tree clumps before it starts working on the mass points. You might think, well, why not rush to the mass points first, then reclaim the trees? And the answer is because once he drives through the uh, trees, literally once the unit's gone through them, it destroys the clumps. And if we take a look at this engineer, 1800 energy already, now 1900, 1981, 2061. So you can see a huge amount of energy to be had. For reclaiming those trees. Somebody's screaming. Yeah, we know. Get on with the middle. This player's already having 
got a, a lot of the reclaim dealt with before the two beach players even get there. You see the three Salem wrecks have long gone. And if we take a look at those mass values, very effective. Can I maintain that? Uh, well, actually, look at this. Like, a nice lump of mass there around Swire's Axe Commander. Uh, Luca's actually not having that mass to enjoy. Marcus deciding to push forward and deal with some of these uh, units from Silent Bug that's encroaching. Gets himself an engineer and a radar. Thankfully for Silent Bug, does manage to bring his second engineer out. But being A on every unit at the Tech 1 stage is two shots per kill. And that includes the Auroras as well as the light assault bots. Suddenly Silent Bug finds himself a little bit at risk here. He's got a uh, high health commander there, Lucas, together with several Mantis going for him. Swyazak comes back, saving the day there. Swyazak, of course, the player from Team 2, had wandered way beyond uh, his area before doubling back. And comes back just in time. Silent Bug dips into the sea with 3,500 hit points and appears to be living up to his name, silently creeping away where nobody can see him. That's why Zach is going to stay there and pick up some of the pieces at the Tech 1 stage. Of course, why not? Kill some of the units, get some veterancy, and then, as they die, you've got the reclaim. Although Ospol, looks like this was this uh, engineer that we were talking about, is going to have its way with the reclaim. And why not? Seems that uh, the Team 1 currently controlling the air as the drone only takes one shot from the cheapest interceptor to shoot down but nobody uh, from team two in the area to do such a thing and so there we have it at seven minutes the opening stages of the game appear to be fizzling out and if we take a little look at the score overall here we see the live incomes from the two teams a very minor advantage for team two there uh, well, it was minor when I first looked. Now it looks more like 20 mass per tick ahead. So that's roughly 10% at this stage of the game. Although if we take a look at the mass totalities, that's probably a more accurate figure. Um, we can see there that uh, 64 versus 62, uh, 64 versus 63. So team two, about 1500 mass ahead over the entirety of the game so far. That includes all reclaimed as well as all income or all mind mass, should we perhaps say, combined. And looks like Swyazak bailing out the central area as well. And Team 1 appears to be setting up shop on the central region. In fact, Ospol here even going so far as to put a mass point down with his drone. Marcus says, re Marcus says really, well, with regards to this drone, of course, uh, Ospol, the red player, is the air player. So it's very unusual for the air player to come down here. Osborne says, why not? Payback is eight seconds. Uh, so I'm unsure if he means it's too close to the enemy or if uh, Marcus says, by rights, that should be mine. Um, but either way, Osborne seems content with taking it. All right. So... Good game, please. Are you the first player to break through the 100 mass per tick mark? Is of course the uh, cliff uh, position, which, providing you get your side island, is and always was the uh, the slot that gave you the most economy. Of course, you're also expected to fight the hardest, uh, especially if your front player bows out, or even if not, because traditionally then the beach and the uh, uh, front player hook up together. Uh, to challenge you, fully aware that you have more economy than anybody else. I'll have to see if that makes uh, any difference at this stage of the game. And it looks like we have our first few naval engagements there in the northern ponds. We've got... Uh, VIP sub versus the frigates, and we've got a drop on the cards here from Swyazak. He's leading the ship with a couple of interceptors. That's going to clear the way for him. Let's have a look what he's got. Five Sparkies on board. So the Sparkies, of course, unique to the UEF. 
pings going down there, so players from Team 1 certainly aware of what's going on. Being a Tech 2 transport, it's going to be a little harder to shoot down than some. See you very quick off the mark, puts down a Tech 1 point defence. Of course, the Spark is the only engineers capable of shooting. And they're going to stop and try and put down a point defence. Unfortunately, it would seem from their point of view that uh, you on the ball there, having only Tech 1 engineers, but a lot more of them. And Swayasak suddenly pushed back. He's still got the five engineers that he started with, one of them heavily damaged. And they have now managed to establish a Tech 1 point defence. So I'm not sure Yu's going to be able to keep this one. You see, he's trying to save it. Gets the wall online. See how many hit points the wall blocks. But it would appear it's too late. Now the point defence can turn its attention towards the engineers. And of course, being Tech 2 engineers, the Sparky, they can build themselves the triad. They've done just that, although it does appear... I say it does appear that he kept for the engineers actually then loses an engineer as uh, the entire wall section there I'm not sure if it was detonated or what happened but Swayazak down to just three of the sparkies that he started with let's have a look what he can see from his point of view oh there's your answer not much Looks like Ospol's the first player to think about dealing with this. Sends out three Tech 1 bombers. That takes out another spark. He also deals damage to one of the triads. Spiazak trying to push out with his spark. He loses another down to just one. Does manage to get himself an air factory online. The triads here are going to be unable to take out these mass extractors belonging to you. But have taken the nearest and the mid one. Don't forget, every mass extractor on the side island was already up to the Tech 2 stage. And so, not going well to have such a raid to deal with. Although, Ospol really playing well. I said he punched above his weight, and here's why. Saving you and his side island, no doubt about it. You who's lost only t two of the mass extractors and all ability to defend... He's also lost the naval yard here as well as a land factory. Ospol, though, finally shot it down. Shut it down, should we say. All the Sparkies are down. He's still got four bombers in the area, now three. The only question is, will this triad pick off the land factory? But indeed it does. So we'll have to see if anybody's able to do anything there. I do love this. Ospol, look at him, sending his early air down to the side island to try and screen and to try and defend. Here we see Tech 2 fighter bombers from Swayazak, the Janus coming across. Ospol ready to deal with that. Still with his Tech 1 bombers, he's going to be able to finish shutting down that triad. And with it, I think the day has been saved. Also leaves a lot of reclaim on that side island for whoever gets there first. So you may say, well... A cat's off mass extractors, nine mass per tick, two of them missing, that makes 18. That you is not enjoying. Okay, so two or three minutes without that, and then the reclaim, does it pay for itself? Well, we've got, we've probably got a few thousand if we zoom out on there. Yeah, look at that. 5,000 mass on the side island forever gets there first, that more than pays for it. That is, of course, assuming you gets there first, because it does appear that Spyazak is sending another ship through. Let's see what's on this one. I realize we're focusing very heavily on the southern island at the minute. Ten Tech 1 engineers, so no, no ability to build any Tech 2 structures. And it looks like Spyazak is going to get there first. Although we've also got a drop uh, coming in from the north. It's you himself! He's flown the commander in, and that's kind of dicey. There was a air superiority fighter overhead. Just the one, but you can see how quickly that damages things. And you, well, he puts down a radar, and he's a Tech 3 commander, so a fast upgrade to the Tech 3. And, of course, the engineers here just Tech 1. 
the Cerberus turret, arguably the best C2 unit in the game at dealing with Tech 1 units, of which we count the engineers. And there we can see no troubles whatsoever. That incursion from Zweierzak has met its sticky end. And with it, uh, Yu's going to be able to establish his base. He's actually wasting no time. Look at that. He's going straight on to building Tech 3 mass extractors. Why waste time building Tech 1 to have to upgrade them? Just go straight for Tech 3. Even if it is just 15 minutes in. Meanwhile, on the northern side of things... He is still jostling for positions there. VIP. Feeling things out with his sub. Lucas with a couple of subs of his own. Both players are having made the switch up to Tech 2 as well. Providing the players stick to their factions. This will be a UEF versus Seraphim effect. Although Marcus has dipped his toe into the water, he's gotten a Tech 1 naval yard there ready with lots of build capacity. I suspect he'll be thinking about assisting once his upgrades are complete. Take another look into the middle. VIP sending one destroyer into the central area, testing out the shielding of his opponent doesn't cause any damage Lucas moves in to dissuade the destroyer from hanging around and this could be the first bit of real action we've seen in the north I realised there was a couple of probing attacks but nothing serious and it would appear that both players backing off frigate there from VIP at risk of going down and Lucas is one of gonna gonna want to combine the shield with his forces. Shield by itself, pretty useless, of course. Meanwhile, in the southern pond, Swayzak's flown himself out. He's Tech Three as well, and he's firing tack missiles out. It does appear that he's been spotted. The tack missiles seemingly to destroy the navy construction facilities that you has. Oh, a missile has missed but he's gone picked up he's, he's flown in some engineers that's got shot down from Ospol of course those Tech 2 transports were also Swayazak's way home and they've been taken out by a very attentive air player very quick off the ball there we see another naval yard going down belonging to you the problem is Tsuyazak's got Navy overhead, which includes destroyers, and of course the destroyers very effective at dealing damage to any unit below the sea, <laughs> including the commander and Tech 3 or not. Tsuyazak's, of course, has the ability to reclaim enemy ships. He'd be better off using his TAC missile, actually, to fire, providing you doesn't move them. Here we can see the hit points of this destroyer is evaporating, but not quick enough. Finally fires out a missile. There we go. Takes out one of the destroyers. And of course, being Tech 3, he will load very quickly. He needs to fire again onto the next destroyer. This one, finish it off, for goodness sake. He leaves it at 99 hit points. He fires off another missile. You see, it's not quite enough to one-shot the destroyer. He takes out the second now trying to build more torpedo launchers as soon as he tries to build those it redirects the destroyer's focus he's at 3900 hit points you finally realizes he's got to move 3000 hit points now he's still got three destroyers after him as two new ones roll onto the scene he's trying to work onto a shield it's 2000 hit points 15 12 sub thousand and it's good night the first player to succumb Smyazak gives out the GG's. You finds it funny. Lols off the GG. Well, I actually think it, it, it was... It was a good tactic. And I wonder if it would have been as effective. Or if uh, you would have been as quick to shut him down. Had Ospol not shot down those two transports that were full of engineers. 
heading Swiazak's way, that would of course enable him to build navy yards or torpedo defense or anything. It certainly wouldn't have been as easy as that. As we see, it was pretty much one-way traffic without the commander. There's nothing else there to help Swiazak. Meanwhile, Northern Pond. See VAP having a go. And Marcus did assist. He's gotten the upgrade to Tech 2. And we have at least one destroyer out. VIP loses a high-value cruiser there. He still had many kills. Now at risk of losing a destroyer. And there it goes. So I think VIP no choice but to retreat. Uh, Lucas once again for some reason leaving a lot of uh, shield boats at home. I just want to combine surely the shield boats with the navy. It's a uh, force multiplier. Yu flies himself home, considers the job on the side island complete. Uh, has mass extractors. Oh, for reasons not entirely sh sure to me, he set the other mass extractors at Tech 2. Only that one mass extractor did he go for Tech 3. I assume he's going to cap them off and then upgrade with those engineers. VIP being pushed back and Lucas taking the opportunity to apply pressure to the front line from Team 2. Of course, already had to concede the central bridge area. They have shielded up their mass extractors and are all Tech 3 and capped off. They've also got an Omni sensor right here. Uh, so this is a valuable area for Team 2. All the intel as well as uh, what we're talking 56 mass per tick just tied up in this area here. So VIP is going to have to play clever to not concede too much ground, but at the same time, not throw away his units needlessly. How do you appear threatening? You've got to do a Sun Tzu. And it appears that VIP has done just that with an inferior navy. This kept Lucas on his toes. Although, I say inferior, here's why. He's made the switch up to Tech 3. We've got at least two sub-hunters in there. That could be the third indeed it is. And so these submarines, these U-boats, with the ability, of course, to fire torpedoes at a target. And once they've destroyed the target, any remaining torpedoes will then no longer go to waste, but will automatically redirect themselves and seek out a new target, which makes the uh, Seraphim Hunter incredibly dangerous. I remember at one point they were a little overpowered. Then they nerfed them, and then it seems that nobody really bothered with them too much. And then since the last update, which must have been years ago now, here we see, here we see the danger. So they've destroyed a target there, and there we see the torpedoes redirecting. Let's have a look. They destroy. They destroy that one. See there how they redirect, they circle, go for another engine. Of course, they still have a limited range. Destroy that one. See, it redirects. That is so cool. Whoever at FAF headquarters was behind things like that is always appreciated, even just as a commentator watching the game. Sometimes we get to appreciate these things more. Because we, you know, when you're in the height of the, of the game and focusing on micro, you don't always get to zoom in and enjoy all the effects. I have to say though, from VIP's point of view, this game is looking much better than it did two or three minutes ago. Luke has been forced well past the 50-way mark towards his base. We do see you getting stuck in as well, throwing a through a few destroyers across the bridgeway. Actually, something I very rarely see, because the cyber destroyer has been able to walk on land. It's not always though I see them switching pond, and here you see actually these destroyers succumbing to the superior range of these. Sub hunters. Yeah, 
this is unfortunate here from you. He could perhaps do worse than hand over these ships to Lucas, or at least to Marcus, one or the other. I think uh, you, despite being a 2100, has got enough to do over here. You, the first player, look at this, to reach the 600 mass per tick mark, the next nearest player of... Uh, I was going to say VIP. Correction is Silent Book, because of course he sat on two bases. Uh, so I'll take that back, perhaps. The two players making 600. Although Silent Bug could perhaps be... Uh, uh, has he got everything? One way to find out. Yep, he's got every mass extractor up to Tech 3. So all the other mass comes from Reclaim. We'll have to see if it's going to remain like that because it does appear that good game, please. You is thinking about applying the pressure. He's above halfway. But the real action, the only game in town right now, is in the Northern Pond. It's VIP applying pressure there to the coastline as we see it. From Luca's point of view. From the uh, perspective of Team 1. And here we see just how deadly these boats are. These U-boats. Look at them just tearing apart these destroyers. It does appear that the destroyers are almost useless versus these U-boats. And Lucas there making the switch to Torpedo Bomber. I don't know how many that were. Seven or eight. Certainly taking out one of the subs <laughs> and a mass naval yard building operation here from VIPs just spamming out engineers from them nothing but to try and bag himself as much reclaim as possible and that's because as well as the tech 3 subs we've now got ourselves a battleship from team 2 and there we see it causing destruction a naval yard there a little ambitious from Marcus no not trying to get in his hands on some of the reclaim out come some destroyers from Lucas, but I think these two have bitten off far more than they can chew. He's going to go down with just one kill. This guy's got three kills. I imagine they're all uh, engineers. There he goes. As VIP just tips more battleships into the area all the time. We okay, Top? Asked Oz Paul. Good question from a team player. Genghis can use mass if you can't, says Swayazak to Silent Bug. So if we take a look at Silent Bug, well, he's got almost uh, 18 in the bank. Uh, Genghis Khan, well, I guess he was given a big gift there because he's about minus 200. Uh, so Swayazak clearly using some sort, of, uh, some sort of mod that allows him to see how much mass his own team players have. Big wave of torpedo bombers here from Ospol, what we're talking. 58 of them. Oh, and he turns them round. He, he doesn't commit. He turns them round, no doubt, because of this nuke. As if Lucas wasn't struggling enough already. In comes the nuke. We've got a Tech 3 Naval HQ there. We've got two fusion reactors. We've got three Tech 3 mass points that were capped off. And a whole bunch of build capacity that's just gone up. So I think that's going to be a bit disheartening to the 1800 beach player who, let's face it, was struggling anyway. He does get himself an Atlantis experimental aircraft carrier out. Perhaps the best unit that the UEF have to deal with masses of Tech 3 sub hunters. Ospol sends all of his torpedo bombers south. He's going after the experimental battleship here, the Tempest. He unloads. Genghis Khan did move in to intercept, but I imagine almost all of the torpedo bombers got through. None of them are going to get a second chance, and it wipes off, what's that, 50-60% of the hit points there. But, uh, the battleship survives. Of course, always able to put out 100% of the damage until it's dead. A 
VIP. Closing in the net around the beach player, taking out the cliff position and looks like dominating everywhere between. Got a few frigates uh, from Lucas that came out harassing the engineers, but that's all. A few engineers here from Lucas as well. More torpedo bombers going after these sub hunters. Down goes two more, and there's a third. And actually, Marcus making the switch up to uh, the subs, so no longer producing destroyers, but producing the barracudas. Of course, these guys have stealth on board, so that somewhat negates the advanced range that the Seraphim have. You can't shoot at what you can't see. Ospol going on a uh, CIA intelligence gathering mission, seeing what is what. Runs rings around the defending air there from Genghis Khan and gets a good view. It's actually a good opportunity to see what's happening as we approach or just past the half hour mark. View down here. Almost a mirror matchup of what's going on on the flip side there with Lucas. Although Silent Bug looking much stronger through the central region, especially with these Tempest. It's actually VIP making much more progress there. And that could, of course, be due to Lucas having one base, not two. Silent Bug, of course, having access to two negates any economic advantage you may have from the side island there. Which is uh, north of 150 mass per tick, 27 times uh, 5. That's about 150. <laughs> Too early in the morning for my brain. Experimental aircraft carry here with 21,000 mass worth of kills. See how it's really struggling though versus just four Tech 3 sub hunters. And here's the side that players begin to know it's all over. Just producing engineers to reclaim that were previously assisting naval yards. It's that time. Ospol wants the dead player on the opposite team to leave. Well, unless he's causing lag, I don't see why he should. Doesn't get uh, any advantages that we don't have. He can only ever see what his team can see, which is this view. So, I guess it could be potentially argued that he can has the ability to see things that his team might be too busy to see and can point them out but that is an advantage that is of course open to anybody once they die so it's not cheating you comes in just as Genghis Khan decides to go after Ospol Ospol who does seem to have fewer ASF and again Silent Bug actually pushing out just as a nuke comes in that's versus Hughes Navy, takes out uh, the HQ, also takes out a battleship that had only just come off the line. Untold numbers of build capacity with it. And I think there that that is going to cause Team 1 a lot of difficulty. Team 1 who have all but lost the Northern Pond. We're starting to get pushed back in the southern pond and a well-placed nuke. Who fired it? Was it from over here? Yes, it was. 299 kills from this guy. Of course, uh, has had two successful impacts. Marcus. Leaving. Here he is. There he goes. Marcus calls it GG. There's some uh, talk there about the electricity being switched off in Ukraine from time to time. 
Some accusing others of quitting while others are saying it's uh, due to the power in the Ukraine. Is of course understandable. You now making use of masses of torpedo bombers, of course, having lost the ability to produce quite as much navy. He's still got a bunch of naval yards on the side island, all of which appear to be T3, which is, of course, important. Even if you don't intend on building T3 units, they have more hit points and can, of course, build Tech 2 units or even Tech 1 units far quicker than their respective counterparts. But it would appear that at least at this moment in time, you has the numbers to deal with this for now. Genghis Khan with a huge ball of ASF dealing with all of these torpedo number uh, torpedo bombers. Be nice to see Ospol getting involved. So I was singing his praises earlier on. Seems to be a bit slow now. But as we look back. Silent Bug relentless with his push. I mean, is this really a 1400 pushing back a 2100? And I'm aware the 2100 had uh, one base, not two, but it was the bigger base. Got VIP with some fighter bombers here to add insult to injury. Here they come. You thinking of that does manage to get some anti air on. Oh, he's going for the nuke defense. And you know what? Two or three more, whether the shield would have gone and the nuke defense would have gone as well. It's understandable why VIP wants to take that out. He is, of course, the player with the nuke. We take a look up north. VIP encroaching onto the enemy's territory. With an incursion onto the beach there. Lots of engineers, factories. Look at all these Tech 3 subs. I mean, they, unfortunately... No longer with a job to do. Being Seraphim, they are the best versus other subs, but they unable to fire nukes. The battleships, however, do have the ability to produce nukes, as well as that ridiculous range. Meanwhile, further south, once again, I mean, I, I should have to think how many torpedo bombers have been chucked south here by you. And Genghis Khan just picking them off with his air force. You, to his credit, has held longer than I thought he would after that nuke came in from VIP. But certainly the trend is one directional. And this time Genghis Khan's trickling torpedo bombers through. Out comes nuclear missile number three from VIP. And that... Uh, there's anti-nukes over there. It's going here. I believe one of these yards was handed off to you. From the central player. That bags both of those naval yards. Luckily for uh, you. He was able to keep his battleship this time. But yeah. Bill capacity. Dropping away from you. What's his economic situation? Well he's still not able to. Or should I say. He's still more than able to spend all his economy. So whatever he's doing. The loss of build capacity. Isn't necessarily the main issue facing him. What is a problem though is all of this air. If you could pick that air off and allow you, oh sorry, if uh, Ospol could pick the air off there and allow you to get in with more of these torpedo bombers so that they can perhaps get more than one pass, if that. But yeah. You beginning to lose his side island. One of the mass points is down, as is the nuke defense. He's got all his Tech 3 naval yards here. And a never-ending stream of torpedo bombers from Genghis Khan. I mean, they're just trickling in. And are actually getting a second pass. There's a cruiser there with 35 kills. But it's not going to get many more. 36 and then it pops its clogs. Tempest down here taking an interest to the battleship. The battleship might be able to pick it off if it's uh, if nobody else interferes with that fight. Tempest connects with the battleship. Off goes 8,000 hit points. Battleship connects with the Tempest. 
And off go about five or six. Just one more shot. This should be the killing blow. Minor victory. Let's have a look further to the north. I do like to see the red and the blue together. So often you see these as opposite numbers. But there we see the red and blue. Surrounded by white. So you got your red, white and blue. And here it does appear. Yu realises the gig's up. He's sending his support commanders to the north. The support commanders, of course, uh, with their RAS presets, as to be expected, if we come to the north. Well, here's what's sucking up the economy. We've got a Maver here. It's 6,000 hit points out of 8. And going up pretty quickly, Ospol's actually paused his air to try and get this complete. Now, let's have a look what's the economic situation here. Well... They're all spent up. Um, you with about 5,000 mass in the bank, but that's not, you know, that's not more than a few seconds worth. We see their team one, they're making 1,800 mass per tick. Silent bug. His turn to have a look what's going on over uh, the enemy bases. As he continues to press, and yet yeah, you here is all but finished. You with a few engineers trying to get what he can, but I don't even think he's going to get much. The navy from Silent Bug's got nothing else to go after. There's VIP. Long since won the northern side. Forces uh, Lucas to begin static defense operations. Loses a fusion gen there thanks to all the insane range of those cruisers. What is Genghis Khan doing? Decides to park his air over the top of Team 1's Samsite City. Baghdad 1991. Realises his mistake backs off, but uh, even then I think he's still got uh, air dominance. And here's the Maver. The Mava. Let's have a little look right there. Let's get ourselves a screenshot. For the extended pleasure. And there we go. We get to see the first shot fire off. I do wonder, oops, one sec, apologies. I do wonder if the uh, Southern team, team number two, are aware of it. Well, <laughs> there's your answer. Actually, VIP finds it hilarious. They don't actually realise it's completed construction, but they uh, see it there. Where's it firing? Well, here's your answer. VIP's managed to get himself a YOLO. And out goes the first missile, just as the first rounds from the Maver coming in. The shields are cracked. Oh, painful. That round had been just an inch further south, or to our right, should we perhaps say, would have got it. We'll have to check in on that nuke in a minute. The shield's cracked for a second time. Where's the rounds? There it is. <laughs> the experimental nuke is down just as the missile makes its way towards team number one's base. Don't forget, it's going to take two missiles to shoot it down or two anti-nukes. And there it goes. Suddenly, VIP might not be laughing so much anymore. VIP... Asking why he stalled or why somebody stalled. I'm not sure that it was a stall. I think that the shields were cracked. VIP then fires a another nuke out. A regular nuke this time. And so, yeah, if we take a look from VIP's team or team number two's point of view. I mean, they've got 80 to 90% of the map. Um could argue that team one has sat on they've got the air base and maybe half of the cliff position but uh, even that's beginning to crumble in comes a regular nuke 
And that's been shot down. The Mava having redirected its uh, zone of interest. Well, it's beginning to crack the air player's grid at the back. To see there several structures. Genghis Khan though has expanded his air grid further to the north. I'll just track one more of these. Let's see if uh, see if the Maver could hit. Of course, when it's destroyed, that's a nice shot there. Bunch of build capacity, couple of fusions. Of course, when they destroy the target they're going after, there's still three or four shots in the air. That was another beautiful shot right there. Silent Bug detonating some of the useless navy now that he's won. Just wonder, Genghis Khan, I mean, he's got a lot of air over here, which includes bombers. What's he actually got? Let's have a look. Uh, almost 300 AC at ASF, six strat bombers, 196 tech one bombers. Correction, there's a bunch more strategic bombers just making their way over. We've got ourselves 30 strategic bombers and 196 Tech 1 bombers and a bunch of ASF. Versus, let's slow time down. I just want to make sure we see what we're dealing with here. We've got 45 SAM sites from Ospol. We've got another 34 SAM sites there from you and Lucas. Another 18. So we basically got a hundred SAM sites here in just this part of the map. And it looks like Genghis Khan is moving in. Leads the way with his Tech 1 bombers. Of course, that's going to tie up some of these SAM sites. But don't forget, there's a bunch of strategic bombers in this clump as well. In they come. I think I'm going to slow time down here. Genghis Khan. Rather than setting all of his strat bombers in a single row, he's actually created two rows. Look at that. Slow time down even more. There's the Maver. But we can see here the bombs from the strategic bombers starting to fall off. Down they go. One shield's cracked. There's at least one shield that remains covering the Maver. Down that one goes. I think it's an open goal now. We've still got a shed load of strategic bombers coming in. And that right there is a dead Maver. It's just a matter of wait for the animations to catch up. In still come a row of Tech 1 bombers. Well, target destroyed. They're going to have to find something else to do. And there we have it. The Maver wreck. With it. Have Team 1's chances just fizzled out. We'll go back to full speed. Absolutely beautiful. Look at all those Sams there. And actually killing a sizable chunk of the air. Actually half of the air force that uh, Genghis Khan had just been taken out. Rebuild it, says you. Rebuild it. VIP says, okay, our air is smarter. Well, for an 1100 to tie up the Sams with the Tech 1 bombers while the Strat bombers sneak in round behind... Well, it's not your typical 1100 that comes out with moves like that, is it? But we see it here today. Just as Ospol sends out the first defense sat across the way. Apparently a kill to its name already. We've got our first experimentals making their way north. GCs, we've got pings there. It's unclear who is pinging. Is that a warning to the from the northern team or is it a southern team saying hey don't just stand them there move them either way Smyazak says standing in our team well there's the answer I think it's the uh, southern team saying what, what, what are you doing here either move them in or pull them out and it does indeed seem that uh, northern team are rebuilding the Maver Slightly unfortunate that they didn't get uh, the 50%. Maybe the wreck was too damaged to get a full 50% bonus build. Looks like they were starting more like 25%. Another big spy run 
from Silent Bug. As we hear lots of... Lots of just constant action. And in move now the GCs. This one very heavily damaged. See, it's already taken out a few of the outer structures. Monkey Lord from you on defensive operations. We've got sporadic artillery pieces. We've got VIP sending in mobile missile launchers just to tie things up. We've got a huge wave of Tet-1 bombers now from Ospol. Ospol has been a little quiet on the aviation front since undertaking the Maver. Now working versus the GC very effectively. Might actually kill off the GC before the Monkey Lord goes. It's going to be very close. But yet, yeah, thanks to all of those bombers as well as the fatty back here. The immediate threat has been dealt with. Ospol redirects his air to take out the mobile missile launchers here. Who do manage to crack the shields between them. But uh, then taken out before they can inflict any real damage. It does appear there that they're able to cause some very minor damage to one of the point defences but I doubt Team 1 are going to worry too much about that this time it's Team 1's turn to send out uh, their spy planes see what is what of course got the spy satellite here that's actually been allowed to inflict a lot of damage look at this Genghis Khan with uh, two PGNs two fusions in a little grid together with mass storage trying to bolster his economic situation leaves it undefended and the easy pickings there for the defense sats doing anything but defensive work and there's a uh, good scouting run as we hear support commanders popping off look at this Genghis Khan has taken the forward mass points he's got them all up to tech 3 and capped off this is the air player from down here. We'll say uh, tap missile launcher, a single one from Team 1 will be able to deal with that. But if I imagine that they're completely tied up. Let's see how the Mavers do it. Well, it's uh, about 90% complete. Lucas says to scout. Ah, considering popping off at the side island, why not? Players sending mass to Ospol so he can finish it. And looks like Maver's about to go on. Just as two GCs arrive from the south from Genghis Khan. They bag one of the monkey lords that's there. They turn their attention to a support commander. Just as two more monkey lords move in. One of them which is heavily damaged. Down goes the second Monkey Lord. Let's just have a look. And yes, the Maver is online for the second time this game. As we continue south. This time it's you who's chucking the Tech 1 Bombers versus the GCs as they take out a third Monkey Lord. Finally, one of the GCs goes down. This time it's us, Paul, as well as you. Both of them working on that last GC. Looks like it's going to take out... Yet another Monkey Lord. That's four Monkey Lords been taken out by two GCs. We've also got spy planes here. We've got three more GCs following it up. And the Maver is up. It's firing away. Down go the spy planes. Is there anything else that we see? Well, it seems to be this. Finally, down goes the GCs. And for those that were doubting the screenshot, it was well, it was something there with all of these, uh, all of these Cerberus turrets, not necessarily the best versus experimental units, but you know, if the only tool you've got on all of that stuff. It's like the lead GC here causing the most damage, also receiving the most damage. 
pick up the pace a little bit. So we slow down time just a tad. Allow some of you to enjoy the effects. Like I say that you don't normally get to see that GC is causing an insane amount of damage. In comes a massive wave of fighters together with some strategic bombers. And it looks like they're moving in towards the Maver. The Maver that's got 10 kills so far. Still lots of SAM sites in the area. Genghis Khan fancies his chances again. I think this time he clumped his uh, fighters up, his bombers too close together. Indeed he did. He was able to crack the shield, but not take out the Maver. I reckon if he'd have spaced him out a bit more, that would have done it. Maver is very exposed though, down to just 25% health. Back to the GCs, one of them's been taken out. Here's the next closest one. Two Monkey Lords working together on it. They're gonna take out the second. We've got that third GC here. We've got yet another one from Genghis Khan and then yet another one from Silent Bug. We've got two more over here from Silent Bug. This is unbelievable. In come yet another raid on the Maver. This time Genghis Khan trying from the other flank. And this time it looks like he has spaced them out a little better. The question is, are there enough to get through? Maver is very heavily damaged, so it's not going to take much to take it out. And I think they've got it. Yes, they do. Wow. Unbelievable, unbelievable ending to a game. And it's not yet over. Look at all the ravages they've got. Uh, fat boys here. They've got a few, more than a few support commanders. Be nice to see uh, the support commanders build perhaps a few more ravages here. Down goes yet another GC. I mean, the amount of mass on the field here is unbelievable. Team 1 do have a perimeter station to have pretty good intel on what is what. Yet another fat boy rolling in. Question is, can they hold Monkey Lords here versus GC? There's Ravagers there. Support Commanders. Down goes the GC first. We've got so much. This is unbelievable. Let me just slow this right down. Look at this. In fact... That right there could be one of the most beautiful sights you'll ever see on this game. Look at it. Unbelievable. All of that Cerberus fire on the GC. Look at it glowing up red. See it from the GC's point of view. Of course, we've got the uh, various gunships from above as well. And down it goes. Now I'm going to turn their attention to this one. There we go. Quick as a flash. Let's go back to... Uh, normal view. Normal speed. And both of the GCs are finally dealt with. I don't know how many that's been. <laughs> Count them. We've got a fat boy over here from Silent Bug. Well, that's moving in. And this to me looks like once again an experimental nuke coming from VIP's way. He's actually built it in the exact same spot. Why waste time? He says looking for a new place to build it. And that is going to connect. And that is a massive hole that's going to be punched through the front door of Team 1 who are already down to just one eighth of the map. They're operating entirely from the air player's base. Team 2 literally sat on seven of the eight bases, including the two side islands, and pumping out more nukes all the time. Got a few strats there from Genghis Khan that were perhaps trying to soften up the periphery. Well, that's all that they're going to do. Release. <laughs> a million engineers on the way from Silent Bug. And uh, Lucas with a support commander to try and deal with it. How's the Maver doing? Well, they're trying to build it for a third time. And it's just past the 50-way mark for the third time. 
And at 54 minutes, who do you think's going to win? Well, VIP says, I'm laughing again. As this experimental nuke seems to be able to wipe out the defenses that Team 1 have with impunity. And that right there takes out a large percentage of the structures that Lucas has. And of course, we've seen Genghis favour this path with his strategic bombers. Well, that gives them more or less free access all the way through. We've got a few SAM sites there from you. A couple more here from Ozport. But we've also got so much uh, reclaim here. Let's have a little look on the old uh, reclaim side of things. We've got half a million reclaim from Team 1 and that figure is going to fly up. Look at that. It's like 3,000, 2, 3,000 every time it ticks over. In comes yet another nuke from VIP. Should say experimental nuke. Let's look at it. Wipe out all the wreckage as well. Bang. For reasons not always clear to me, some of the stuff sometimes remains behind. It's always weird when you see, like, a Tech 3 engineer or something survive. Could be if the uh, blast radiates outwards and the engineer is moving inwards at the same time. It, it could be something like that. Yeah, another experimental nuke on the way from VIP. How's the Ava? Well, it's moments away from coming online for the third time. Players there desperately contributing all their mass over to Ospol. Ospol, who's chiefly behind the construction, and there it is. The, uh, what was, I believe, um, the largest, most expensive unit in the game at one point, the Maeve, before the experimental nuke, before the Paragon. Oh, no! Pause. I just saw a huge round connect and crack the shield. Has, don't tell me, somebody else has built a Maver. They have. Silent Bug has managed to build a Maver as well. And it looks like the first shot that impacted cracked the shield. Let's unpause. In comes the second round from Silent Bug. And that's going to be it. <laughs> The, the Maver's only been online for two seconds. And Ospol eats one to the face. The Maver, third time online, was not to be third time. The charm gets just two shots off before it's destroyed completely. And with that, the players concede. It's 57 minutes into the game, ladies and gentlemen. What a fantastic game that was. We get the strategic launch just as the final ticks are out. Thank you very much for watching. I do hope you enjoy that. Thanks again for all the patrons that help support what I do here on the channel. As they know, three quarters of my work's already done before I hit record. It is difficult to find good games and it is time consuming. So if you are willing and lucky enough to be in a position to help me do that, please... Uh, do consider checking out the patrons. We've got 32 games over there as of right now. And until next time, wherever in the world you may be, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya.